Welcome to Weddings Unveiled, the podcast designed to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. Here's your host, Angela Profit. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Weddings Unveiled, professional tips and secrets on wedding planning and event design, where we take you behind the scenes of our past experiences in the industry and share with you what we have learned from them and how they have made us stronger. This podcast will help you grow a productive and profitable business to launch you into success within the hospitality industry. Before we get started today, I want to ask you something. Are you looking for the missing piece of the puzzle to grow your business? Well, I want to invite you to watch my free online training on how I went from hobbyist to celebrity wedding planner and how you can do it too. You will discover the puzzle pieces that will absolutely transform your business from hobbyist to like, hell yeah, I can do this full time. On puzzle piece one, I'm going to go all into personality. Puzzle piece two, how to keep the high quality clients happy. Puzzle piece three, I'm going to talk about what separates the good from the great. On four best kept secrets to profitability and all about implementing the strategies. And five, if you're going to attract the best, come on, people, you got to be the best. And then I'm going to show you how to create the magic and put it all together for you and your clients. So don't wait another minute. Go on over to go.angelaprofit.com. That's G O dot Angela Profit, two F's and two T's dot com and watch my free videos and download my free workbooks that will take your business to the next level. Hi y'all, it's Angela Profit here with another episode of Weddings Unveiled. Thank you so much for listening. Today I'm super excited to talk with one of my very, very best friends in this industry. He is the owner and founder of Nashville Event Lighting, and I am finally, after starting this podcast, my gosh, for almost two years, talking to Blake Chaffin. Blake, thanks so much for being here today. How are you? My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm awesome. Yay! I'm excited for everyone to hear your story and your journey and how you think your life is going to be one way when you come to a city and then all this great stuff happens, but in another industry. <laughs> yeah. So before, so a little bit about Blake guys. So the, all the lighting that you see and all of the weddings and all of the events and beautiful chandeliers and up lights and down lights and pin spots and washes and all this great stuff. Lighting was never a budget line item when I first became a planner. And then as I really started to learn about the design, and this is all pre Pinterest. Okay. Like before we started before Pinterest started, um, I, I really didn't understand. And so like, why don't we start off by you telling everybody, where did you come from? Like your background, how'd you get to Nashville and how the heck did you get into the wedding and events industry? Gosh, uh, the short version is I, I grew up in Kansas and I went to college out there. Um, I had, uh, I, I kind of call it the typical story. I don't know that it just seems common, but I, but I had the, I had the small town mobile DJ business that I started in high school and uh, I went to college at Kansas state university. Um, I built my DJ business while I was in college to have kind of what I called six systems or six different, uh, DJ setups where I could do six parties a night or something. And so I hired, you know, my friends and stuff to go DJ sorority parties or high school dances and all that. So put myself through college, um, um, doing, doing that. And I played in a band and got a marketing degree. And then after that, I moved to Nashville, um, really with the idea of pursuing my dream of, of writing songs and being in the music industry. And, um, so I brought my DJ business down to Nashville, which is where, our paths crossed um, eventually when I was, you know, building my DJ business, I was meeting uh, planners and trying to get events and um, did that for a little bit. And then the story ended up twisting to uh, seeing a need for lighting and also a shift in me as I was getting to my late twenties and stuff. I was, um, 
uh, getting very tired. I, I, I've been a part of um, a lot of events at that point, and I was interested in building a business and thought I had an opportunity to do that with lighting and do something new. Um, so does that answer the question? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm going to back up for a moment because I'll never forget. So we were at this venue um, for a networking meeting that I was kind of new in it. And I, I don't know if you had joined that networking meeting or you were there for a guest. Was it like your first time there yeah. or something? <laughs> yeah, it was my first meeting. Um, yeah, yeah it was first, I was trying to meet people in Nashville and um, I had t signed up for a songwriting class um, at Vanderbilt University um, Blair School of Music. And, I, and in that class, I met some guy that owned a DJ business. He sat in the chair next to me the first night of class. I'm like, you're kidding me. I'm, I, I just got here. Like, I have a background in that. So he started telling me about stuff. And that's when I heard of, I don't know if that was a tweezing meeting or what yeah. that was. But it was like, it's like, oh my gosh. Okay, well, I'll go do that. And, um, you know, there was, there was a lot of, how do I say that politically correct? Oh my God. Like, well, I, I was, I was, I was <laughs> yeah. 24 and 25. <laughs> and, and there was not a lot of other people in my age range, quite honestly, except I saw you and I was like, all right, I don't know who that is, but it seems like she's starting something. And uh, whether it was like, I just, I don't know, I was like looking for the go-getters and you know, how, how am I going to uh, get plugged in here? And so I just, uh, I remember introducing myself to you and just saying, basically, it's like I, I would have worked for free or done anything to, to have a shot to, to get going with my DJ business. So. Yeah, we were, and it's funny, the venue that we were at, it's not really a venue. It kind of never was a venue. It was a gym, and then they turned it into an event space, and I ended up filming my big fat gypsy wedding yeah. um, in that venue, and then, but I actually did have a wedding there right before, God, this was so long ago, and um, there was, I mean, these people were so crazy I mean crazy and so when we went to set up for the wedding there it smelled like dog pee because they had a dog show there like the day before this wedding and then this wedding yeah. was there and they did the money dance which you know I was a very new planner I didn't know what the hell the money dance went it was because in the south we don't really do that and they were from the north and then like the best man lost the money and they got into a punching fight and there was blood going yeah. everywhere. It was just nuts. And then like fast forward a few weeks and then we like had this networking meeting there and I was like, oh my God, I so don't want to go. It smells like dog piss and there's blood in the carpet. <laughs> But I went and yes, that's where we met. And you were like, so I'm in new in town, a DJ and I moved here to do singing songwriting and in my head I'm from Nashville so I'm like like everybody else <laughs> but it, you weren't like everybody else you were a go-getter and after we worked together a couple times together you're like so so you were DJing a wedding you're like I think I may start a lighting business I think there were like 10 up lights at a venue we were we were we mm -hmm. just didn't even know what the hell lighting meant Nope. And then what happened after that? You like had the thought and then what drove you to go and say, okay, I'm going to do this. Like, di didn't you start in your garage? Like, let's just start there. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I, I borrowed $25,000 from my dad. And I was going to buy my first house. And I got to listening to Dave Ramsey <laughs> driving Love around. Dave. I had this idea of like, whoa, it just struck a chord. This like, getting out of debt thing and I owed my dad that money. So I thought if I could find a way to make an extra $150 every time I DJed, you know, that I would get out of debt X quicker or whatever it was. I mean, I, that was as big as I could dream back then. And um, so anyways, I, that was my initial motivation was to like find a way to pay my dad back. And, and then through, through kind of doing that, I started seeing like, whoa, this is fun and creative. And I, I got good at it quick. Um, and I love the challenge of figuring it out because I have zero background in anything lighting related. I meet lighting guys all the time that, that talk lighting language and I know enough to fake it, you know, but truthfully, I can barely, barely run a lighting board. I mean, I can maybe get 
it's to one color. But as far as making moving lights go and programming stuff, I just, I was like, that's fine. I, I don't need to know that. I can, I know people that know how to do that, but, but I love lighting. I love, I, I definitely get it from a design standpoint but um yeah i started just like trying to better my life and, and my situation really and then fell in love with it and uh yeah i started i built my business on cash like just at the time like i was inspired by the like i'm like i mentioned kind of the getting out of debt program and i know that's not everybody's cup of tea but i i started with eight lights and the cardboard boxes that came in i just flipped the flaps um over the boxes and taped them around and kept the lights in there and did it out of my house and I re I was so pumped the day I had five grand to go get my own trailer brand new and where I could keep all my stuff in there. It was like, I never even thought I'd fill that trailer up. It was so big. And um, so anyways, from there, everything just took off and it was, it was crazy. Well, so tell, I, I just, I want our listeners to know because where you came from and where you are now with your business and how you've grown over the years and all the good things and all the challenges. And I mean, I won't say bad things because all of those challenges and crazy things have kind of led you to, you know, being a trooper and then you come out of it. And so from your garage to the trailer, you, then what was the next? Was that the warehouse off of Armory? Was that next? Oh yeah. Well, actually next would have been after we were bursting out of the seams of the bonus room in my house. Um, <laughs> And the garage, and then it was like kind of getting to that point where I couldn't legally run a business out of my house. I mean, I, I never broke the law. I had never had like a money exchange and all that, but it was getting to the point if we were going to have lettered trucks and stuff like that. So I ended up going to storage sheds. I started with um, one storage shed, it went up to four storage sheds. And then at some, I mean, it was so inefficient pulling stuff out of storage sheds and parking the trailer and doing it. So eventually, then um, I took advantage, honestly, of the, uh, kind of the economic downturn there um, in 2008, 2000, 2008 ish, I think 2010 ish, um, you know, warehouses in Nashville were cheap and the draping company and someone else to help rent here to help me pay rent. Cause I don't know what, and of course, like, you know, filled that thing up super quick, but, but uh, yeah, so there, there was just kind of those natural evolutions of, you, you know, you grow until that pain point where, um, what is that saying? The pain of uh, change is, is greater than the pain of same or what, whatever it is. Um, pain of same is greater than the pain of change. I guess that would be it. So it's just like, we can't do this anymore. Bite the bullet. I went and rented a warehouse that was actually like 50 to $150 more than my mortgage at the time. So I was like, oh my gosh, you know, um, how am I going to pay for this? But um, the way you do that is wake up and hustle. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I will say that, um, you know, once you got that warehouse, you filled that pretty quickly and you did, you did some marketing, I would say just from like self-promotion, like open houses, having people out to the warehouse, letting yeah. them know you guys, you ha hired some, uh, an actual sales team to go yeah. out and go to the networking meetings for you so that you could focus on the big picture mm -hmm. and you you chose people really well I think because you worked with coaches who taught you how to hire people who were extremely likable but great at sales and caring um and so I guess sh before we jump from the warehouse to Germantown just because I know your story really well. Yeah. Um, but you started to actually build a team because you went, you know, from one guy working with one guy and then setting everything up to yourself to learning, okay, I need to figure out how to find good people. So just share with our listeners, like, how did you do that? And what, what have you learned from that and growing a team? Gosh, that is the, that to me is like the, the final frontier. I mean, deal, dealing with people and putting a team together that, that, and that's what motivates me most these days is like, is the relationship I have with my employees. I have such great people right now. And I feel so much of the success of my business these days is how do I take care of myself and be a, you know, a good person that, that can, you know, earn the respect of these people and also 
um, just help them, you know, and, and when I make, when I just make it about money or lighting or something, um, there's not a ton of meaning in business or life to me, but when it, you know, when you find ways to impact people and feel like you're contributing to the greater good, of course, that's a bigger thing. So my experience was, yeah, I got to that point where I, um, gosh, you know, I, I know that you, I don't know anyone that's been in the event business that hasn't had those like the 48 hour kind of days or whatever, where you where literally I remember a night I did not sleep. I was tearing down lights all night and I was setting this thing up all day the next day and it just ran in and that's like, I literally didn't sleep getting through the weekend. It's like, I can't do this forever. I can do it because I'm however old I was or whatever. Um, this, of course, that was probably 13 years ago that I was really, um, 10 to 13 years ago that I was really beginning to build. Um, so what I did, a couple of things that, in case it's helpful to anyone else. First of all, I'm, I, I, um, I, I, I always worked in the business, so the most immediate things I did was get someone that could work alongside me. And this was before I knew much about hiring good people, but I would just find a good guy that could just come along and just having that you know, second and third set of hands, I could at least start offloading the really easy stuff. Like, all right, you guys unload the trailer. I still had to do all the thinking and the planning and the interfacing with the clients, but I at least now was starting to save my back a little bit. Um, from there, you know, I, I learned a lot of lessons the hard ways for a couple of years. And then this, the coaches and stuff that were influential were, um, let me see, I, I guess I would, I would kind of separate it into the educational items like, like this podcast we're doing or which of course didn't exist at the time, but books like the E-Myth and, um, people that were inspiring me to work on the business, not in the business, you know, those things were kind of ringing in my ear. And then along the, along the way, I just, um, I always sought out mentors or coaches. Um, specifically, I had a coach um, named Chris Lundeen who was really helpful to me at the time. Um, and I worked with him for about two years with all the, it's essentially the DISC personality stuff. It's not um, exactly DISC, but it's a version like that, most similar to that. And so that was when I started learning about personality styles and all the probably, probably the one-on-one stuff of like, uh, well, I made the mistakes of hiring people like just like me, like, like thinking I needed someone to do everything that I could do. And I realized like, well, I'm, I'm kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. I need to maybe start hiring some masters and people that compliment or, or actually people that, um, I don't mean this to sound like this, but people that I wouldn't hang out with uh, outside of work, you know, it's like you're way well, different. Than me. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's a proven statistic that entrepreneurs typically hire people they like um, or who are just like them because they get along. And really, as we have both learned in growing up together in this industry, you hire people that are not like you <laughs> and people that are amazing at the things that A, you're not good at and B, you don't want to freaking do. Um, so yeah. it can free you up. And I know that, I don't know about you, I'm, I was a major control freak because of customer service. I still am. Um, but how were you able to let go of some of that like control with some of your people like were you just like oh god take this I need help or was there a struggle with some of that like control and also I mean my god you invested a lot of money in new lights and products and how do you even begin to train someone to treat your products as if it's like your newborn child you know <laughs> oh my gosh so difficult um I mean uh <laughs> I, I, I don't even know where to start with that. I mean, I guess I always broke things down into the simple sales and operation kind of categories, right? So um, I remember, um, you know, actually my first employee, David Maddox, was he was more um, he was more office based, and, and it, so not necessarily in the field, but it was just I wanted good customer service and someone that was getting back to people, and I wanted the phone to be answered. This, you know, on that first ring, because it was like, every time you hear that phone to me, that's money, you know. And um, so I actually started, I guess, kind of replacing myself um, in a lot of the administrative stuff. I'm not, 
I can do administrative stuff, but man, when I had someone that was helping me get organized in the office and all that kind of stuff, I could go execute the jobs and make sure planners like yourself were happy and they knew me and had the relationship. So I guess kind of in tandem, I was hiring an admin person and the next would be hiring good crew guys. And could I ever get to a point that I could actually trust this crew guy to take this trailer of lights and go to this job, right? So um, I'm trying to think how I did that. I mean, I've just developed a lot of systems over the years. And I guess um, racially, I would say I worked on side people a lot until I really got where I trusted them. And it's like, and especially if we had stuff that was repeat jobs and it wasn't a one-off in, in a venue we've never worked at, but it was some like, all right, hey man, you've done three jobs here with me at this venue. Can you... Do you have any questions? Like, do you think you could bring, you know, Joey and Bobby over here with you or whatever next time and just do this without me? Would that be, and, and you catch the right person and of course they, the right person's going to step up to that challenge. Like I would love to, I would love to like take on responsibility, you know, and, and do that. So do that. And of course, if there's a struggle or a mistake out there that I haven't had yet, I would love to. Well, I look forward to that opportunity when it comes around, but uh, I've, I've had every kind of fail and um, struggle that you can imagine. And then on the sales side, the same thing, you know, it would be, you know, hiring, hiring kind of a salesperson that can't, doesn't maybe, you know, know technically a lot about the lighting. I would bring them, say, if I was meeting with you, and, hey, I'm going to have this meeting with Angela. She's one of my best clients. I want you to come. I just want you to meet her. I'm not going to just throw you out there right now, but like if you get to know her and whatever, then I would typically go to the people that I knew well, like you and say, Hey, do you mind if I just send my sales person to this meeting? I would love to get her to get some experience on her own, you know? And so some of my people that I had a good relationship with, with, um, they, they had an interest in helping me grow my business too because they were growing theirs and they understood. So I, I picked and choose strategically my, my battles um, on, and, and how I was going to integrate um, people into an environment where I would, was going from 100% control um, to delegating. And then, and then, of course, you learn, I guess, step two of all that is how do you get them integrated and then – or step one is how do you get them integrated? Step two would be how do you have checks and balances? <laughs> you know, how yeah. do you know that people aren't stealing from you? How do you get feedback that you don't send the salesperson to a meeting and he or she's done a horrible job for three meetings and the planner's about to quit using you? And it's like, I want to make sure I set up an environment. Hey, Angela, if you have any problems at all or this is not going well, I've done my best to get them coached up to thinking they can come to this, but let me know if there's problems. So opening those channels of feedback might be another, another important avenue. But I think people want to help you. I think if I've learned anything, you can make nearly any mistake. Um, if you're honest about it and you'll fix it and it's not like an intentional or you weren't trying to hurt someone, I mean... I, I don't know any business in the event business that hasn't made a mistake. I mean, I would just say they're lying if they haven't like completely upset a client or completely dropped the ball or, you know, some of our worst mistakes are we've missed weddings, you know, um, we um, thankfully have never had like a fatal, the wedding couldn't go on because there was no lights, but it was like, ah, they were supposed to have 12 up lights. They didn't. There was total breakdown in, process i mean there was there's failure on the planner's part but you know i've got to just focus and own what we did and how we did it and we were we just had this system and we the the admin guy would put the jobs in this notebook and da 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 and he literally put this particular job just in the wrong place in the wrong notebook and it like so I'm getting off there on a tangent, but um, no, yeah, but integrating employees is difficult. Well, I mean, a couple of things that you said that are very, very, very vital to growing a team is having systems and having processes. And the way that you do those is you get your ass out there on the job site with the people without throwing them in. And you talk through and you walk through and you share your knowledge. And there has to be some level of training to develop these processes and procedures. 
And then from there, it can only get better if you are open to receiving feedback. And one thing that I know that you implemented early on was having these regular team meetings and having, you know, what we call them wrap meetings, where after every single event, we either, well, now since Zoom is so readily available, that didn't exist back then. Mm -hmm. um, but it was like, you know, we used to meet in person and talk about not just the good, but where can we improve? How can we do better? Not necessarily like what went wrong, but opening your, you opening yourself as a business owner and a team leader to your team members like, hey, what happened? Why did it go this way? And you constantly perfected your processes. It's, ne I mean, still to this day, we're changing shit on the fly because there's new resources that are available to us. And so, you know, the point of that is having processes, have procedures, talk to your team, have a good relationship, be an open door. You know, when, we, we're human. We all make mistakes. And I actually remember that night <laughs> that um, you, it, it wasn't my wedding because if it was a wedding that your guys didn't show up, I would have noticed it. And, or one of my, my team members would have noticed it and been like, hey, where are the lighting? I mean, now I have a dedicated team member that that's her sole job. Like my job on a wedding day is I don't book myself doing anything. I'm the eyes and ears for the client. I'm doing the design. I'm doing things that really weren't on the timeline, dealing with unexpected things that come up and then putting people in place. So there's one of my team members that her brain is wired. She's super type A and she's like, oh, the cake's not here. And oh, well, if it's Jay, which is one of our lovely friends, it's like, oh, well, we'll, we'll give him a 15-minute grace period anyway, you know, because they can never be on time. We love him, though. <laughs> and so, you know, but typically it's like the lighting people, I mean, your crew, they're usually freaking early. You know, they're, they're never late, but we would have noticed that. And But then that also goes back to some planners. I mean, we're one women shows. We can't freaking manage. And it's, it's a lot on one person if yeah. you don't have a team. Yeah. And so it wasn't the end of the world that they didn't have 10 up lights. What do you do? Do you strangle the guy who made a mistake and give the client their money back? And my God, I think we both have an email folder, a Dropbox folder where it's like, we've gotten the rudest emails from people where it's like, you have no effing clue what we've been through <laughs> and the, but, but we've overcome them all. You have overcome them all. And then yeah. something that I want you to share too is how you made a situation. Um, you know, at, you were at that warehouse for a long time, did lots of things, lots of growth opportunities. And then something happened that was unexpected before you moved to another warehouse, but thank God you had insurance so if you will share your experience with our listeners of what happened with that. Yeah. Uh, I would say, yeah, I would, I would say one of the two biggest kind of marks on my timeline, um, like as a business owner would be that I had a fire in my warehouse and lost everything in the fire. Um, so I, <laughs> gosh, it was a snow day in Nashville. So let's see. I, How did I guess it can happen. Was it one of because you were in a warehouse? It's almost like one of those places. It was not a standalone warehouse. It's like a ton of warehouses and businesses. Yeah. It wasn't just yeah. a standalone. So, I mean, like what what happened? Was it one of your lights? Was it the next door neighbor? I don't remember the actual details. Yeah, basically, um, we had it was one of our lights. So, long story short, I had a, I had a warehouse fire because of a battery powered light that basically exploded and caught on fire while it was charging. And I guess some of the other details in case they're helpful or, you know, we, we now have a policy. We don't charge any lights um, unattended, with, you know, and we have special um, fire extinguishers even and every, every kind of safety precaution we can have. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, this light, uh, so, so lithium ion batteries, you know, I mean, there, I, there were hoverboard fires, uh, there was a hoverboard craze for a while, but any kind of lithium ion battery that takes an impact, I mean, maybe a 
heads up, you know, if you drop your laptop, I would, I would be cautious about, you know, and, and kind of have it checked um, because um, that's what they're worried about in planes, et cetera. So anyways, these lights, um, uh, fortunately, this whole incident was caught. Some things I learned for in case there's business owners listening. Yes, one, that's what I want you to share. Like okay. I know the number one thing is have insurance, but from there. So, so no, one, I bought the lights new, so they were under warranty. Um, two, I bought them from a dealer rep. We had a, a thing. I had confirmed with this this dealer rep. Hey, how do how do we best care for these lights? And he had told me verbally. Going back, I would have got this in writing, but he told me verbally at a lighting trade show, you want to make sure you keep these plugged in all the time. So the second they come back from the vent, just leave them plugged in all the time because if you leave them sitting on the shelf, the batteries will run down or it's hard on the battery or whatever. But this was his advice. So, okay, cool. We'll have these plugged in all the time, which, which was kind of our, our go-to and just what we did all the time. And um, I had the whole fire caught on night cam video. We had a $360. Thank you, Steve Wells. Um, the employee I had at the time was like really interested in getting, um, whatever, get us a security system. I don't care. Um, you know, and he got this $360 thing and man, it sure helped me out. Um, it recorded the heart of, so this, we, we can see that two 30 in the afternoon an employee um, pulls the, the, the lights went in the case of four lights per this case. And you plug the case into the wall and literally everything we did everything quote unquote right that you could do. The lid to the case is supposed to be open when they're charging. It was open. The lights were in there. You know, we used a regulation UL listed. It wasn't like we had a homemade extension cord plug it in. I mean, it was like to a T I learned a lot because I ended up in a lawsuit, which I'll get to, but basically this light just exploded Crazy. And, um, so, so this light <laughs> explodes. There's about a 16 foot flame. It got over 400 degrees in the warehouse. Like, had to be a million dollars of damage to the the roof. Um, the PVC pipes melted in there. Um, just everything was trashed. Um, so it didn't actually burn. the The fire ran out of basically oxygen really quickly. So I would call it. I'm not a fire expert. Well, in a way I am, but it just burned, <laughs> it just burned really fast and really hot. So it messed everything up. So even like we, we use trussing and I'm guessing some of the listeners are familiar with that. Like trussing, you know, mm -hmm. is trussing has got welds, you know? And so every piece of trust, even though it wasn't quote unquote burnt or we could have cleaned it and used it, it's like, well, you had to prove that those welds were certified and that they weren't compromised. So there's no way you could take that truss and ever hang it again above someone's head. Uh, my thing is always like, if you wouldn't hang this above my nephew or, or, or niece, you know, the, I love those two. <laughs> like if you like yeah. nothing, you know, uh, it would cost more to like get all the welds recertified than it was to buy new truss and stuff. So that's how everything was trashed, even though it didn't necessarily burn. Anyway, so I'm thankful that I had it on video. Um, I am insanely lucky that my, my dad happens to be an insurance agent. Thank God. <laughs> and, uh, he trained you well. Um, yeah, I lost, uh, I lost $386,000 of stuff and I had a $400,000 policy. And it's all because my dad stayed on top of my inventory and my insurance every year. We had a detailed list of like, everything that I owned and I was like that was like oh my gosh I definitely hire that detail person that you need because if you have your stuff in order when a crisis hits it is so much easier we, we had a really cooperative insurance company that took care of us hometown agency I knew my agents I like they were great and um, and my landlords were also great here's another term that I think could help one person out there, but there's a term called a waiver of subrogation. Um, and this was a term in my lease that basically stated, if something happens, the landlord and myself, we were kind of each responsible for our own stuff. So meaning, if, I, if my lights start on fire and burn your building down, you're responsible for your building, I'm responsible for my contents. But also, if his building were to fall on my stuff and ruin it, it's kind of like, hey, man, I, I need to make sure I'm insured 
And like, so I'm probably oversimplifying and some lawyers probably saying I'm wrong or what I'm sure it's, I, I, I don't go into details, but roughly, roughly, um, that term waiver of segregation, I was like, man, I really have looked for that in other leases I've signed because that's kind of a protection thing. And, um, so share, yeah, like share with them. Okay. So you literally lost every piece of shit you owned and, but you had a ton of jobs on the calendar and, and on the books. And I remember you calling me and you're like, holy shit, you know, but I, but you had a solution. And so to get you through until you could get like through insurance and get money back and get new equipment, how did you handle the jobs that you had to show up for and get equipment? And you didn't even know how you were going to do that. How did you think through that? Oh, thankfully, I had lots of great relationships in town, um, in Nashville. Thankfully, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, where there's tons of production companies, not only for the event world, but, the, but I, I have great friends in the touring uh, lighting world. So they do tons of the Nashville country acts or rock bands out of here and all that. So, man, I just got on the phone and, and kind of, again, thank, thank you to my dad on the policy. When something like this happened, I had a hundred thousand dollars that I was allowed to go rent equipment. So basically all I had to do was immediately go rent the trucks I needed. In fact, the insurance company gave me a, a sizable check. Um, I, I think the first day I met with them, they gave me like 20 grand on the spot. Um, and it was just like immediately so that I could go rent trucks that I could, or rent lights, any, anything I needed to pull off the jobs I had. Cause they, their, their interest was to get me back in business and cost them as little money as possible. Um, but yeah, I had a hundred thousand dollars, uh, gosh, that's not, maybe it's called business interruption. Um, or there's another term I'm blanking on right now, but, um, yeah, so I had a hundred grand basically line of credit essentially that I would be in reimbursed for, um, that I could go pull all these jobs off. So we made some mistakes. We had some, like, we had some jobs. It's like, we had to just call people and be like, I, 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 one thing that comes to mind was something about like, you know, we had a lot of specialty items. So it's almost like, like we had these wicker lanterns or something like that. And this client loved them and, and wanted them on their job. And it was like, we had to go get a different substitute and buy some, we, we couldn't actually get that thing again. Um, so we re I don't know if that's necessarily a mistake, yeah. but we had, we had to really juggle a lot of stuff because so much came at us really quick there where it's like, wow, we, we've operated for eight, 10 years with quote unquote, all our stuff and we know what we're doing. And now it's, and I should add, we couldn't even go in there. Like they were doing an investigation on the fire. So we did not want to compromise basically it's like the scene of the crime or whatever that you would call it, but the ground zero, it's like, we couldn't really go in there at all because if we were to do anything that compromised the investigation, they could throw out and you know blame it on us, or or it could, whatever. So that that was the main thing of that. And the other the other part I mentioned that lawsuit. It's like the contaminants from the burning batteries of these lights got in the air duct system and went down. There were like eight businesses in this complex, so mm -hmm. they went down and contaminated a coffee roaster. And um, what? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So um, that lawsuit's still going on. I just got out of it. Um, I Thankfully, I, I sat through all the depositions and did all the stuff. And basically, it was like, you know, it was it's absolutely crazy what goes on there. I sat in front of 12 lawyers and, uh, you know, understand this guy. I won't even go into that because I probably <laughs> should watch what I say. But, but um, anyways, uh, yeah, I, I learned a lot because what, what happens – gosh, this is so much detail. What happens is the battery manufacturer blames the chip manufacturer, blames the LED manufacturer, and then the lighting company tries to say, oh, we're, we didn't even make this. We're just a marketing company. We just market these lights. Like, you know, it was, oh my God. It was really crazy to watch what happened. So I still think my dad thinks it'll take seven years or eight years for that to, to wrap up. But We'll see. But anyways, but you that's did turn like you did get another warehouse and yeah. you did get more. And there was one point I remember 
you're like, I'm just going to sell the business. Like I'm sick of this. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, just as entrepreneurs and business owners, I'm sure if you've been doing this for a while, like you have those days where it's like, damn, shit would be easier if I just, I mean, seriously, I'm like, I just go, would, I could go work at Apple. I could work at Chick-fil-A and say, uh, what do they say? It's in my pleasure. I could, you know, there's a lot yeah. of really easy things that we could do, but I don't think that would necessarily bring us happiness because there's really no challenge typically in those types of roles. And so you started over. I mean, you got a different warehouse, you got new equipment, and yep. you just kept it going pretty much. Oh, man. Yeah, I scrambled. I scrambled. I'm, I'm proud of myself because I, yeah, uh, you should be. I, uh, I almost, yeah, I, I almost sold the business. I talked to someone and, um, I, you know, if anyone's ever interested in talking to me that I'm happy to, I don't think I should go into detail. <laughs> here, but but I'm, I'm happy to talk to him. Um, but I, I thought about that. Um, cause, cause I had, I had also seen a lot of advances in my songwriting career, which, you know, is why I moved to Nashville. And so I thought, eh, maybe, maybe I'd jump to, to the songwriting full time. And, I thought about that and uh, I'm so glad I didn't know because I'm having the, the absolute most fun, like twice as much fun as I've ever had running. So the point is just like that yeah. should happen sometimes, which can just turn yeah. into learning experiences to make you better, make you stronger, mm -hmm. keep going. And of course, ever since both of us have been in this industry, like we literally say like we grew up together because we have in this industry and people are like, are you our brother or sister? <laughs> We're like, no, no, not like no. we grew up together, like literally. But we really have. And we've had people come and go. And I will say, you know, at the end of everything, it is all about relationships, people that you can trust and rely on. And I mean, I can count on probably one hand how many people I would like text or call, you know, for gas or, you know, if my car mm -hmm. broke down. And one of those being AAA or my dealership. <laughs> And, you know, it's like you need those kind of people in this industry that understand what you're going through or, or who can offer like a solution. And yeah. because it's hard to find people who the, the people don't understand, like they don't understand our industry. They don't understand the shit we go through. Mm -hmm. And so in your your new warehouse you you know you hired a new team you got new i mean you kind of just again started over but with yeah. so much more solid knowledge because of everything you'd been through um, so now you know i want you to tell our listeners like what is national event lighting focus on like what's unique about you know cuz you're not just to me yeah, not because my <laughs> y'all like my events they're beautiful and they're perfect but what is unique about the process that Nashville Event Lighting offers guests? Gosh. Um, you know, so we're at a really exciting time again because it's kind of kind of back. I know you you would remember this, but I'm back to that like we're about to get really creative again. Um, it took some while. I think you go back to the fundamentals and the basics in, in the rebuild process. Um, and And so... And, and I kind of wanted to say this, if, if I could pause for a second and just say, you know, you, and I know I'm stealing this cliche from, but it's like, you don't learn anything when times are easy. You know, yep. you learn everything about yourself and through the adversity and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I, I definitely sympathize with anyone starting out and like sometimes go, I don't know if I could survive those 10 years again, but I would say now I, I am just not scared of anything anymore. I'm not scared if an employee quits or leaves or that there's, I, I mean, obviously I'm trying to prevent and of course I'm not reckless, but I would say like, I, I know now that there's so much opportunity in the hard times that I, I'm not really scared of them. I just, I'm not scared of them anymore. <laughs> and so I see them as opportunities, you know, so um, there are benefits when, when things go wrong. And a lot of early on in my business, um, there was a huge lesson and it is really easy to start a business and get going and look hot and, and, and grow your sales. I was growing sales 43% a year and I was just so concerned about hitting a million dollars. And I thought that was success. And, and, 
man, when, when I saw some dips in sales for, for a couple of reasons, um, man, I learned a lot of how I wasn't running my business very well. And so if those times hadn't happened, I would not be in the spot I'm in today. And so to answer the question, what are we doing now? It's like, man, we've got our bases covered. I really worked on the foundation, this, like a seven step sales process and working with this program to kind of make our systems foolproof. And, and my idea is like, I want to lock down as much of the business, get it organized as I can because in the event business, there's no way you can get 100% of it knocked down. But my thought is if you can get it 80% systemized and then leave 20% for the, okay, it's raining, scratch that plan, we're doing something different. Or, you know, or 20% creativity, like, hey, this is mainly what we're going to do. But if you get there and they adjust the layout or they have to do this or something like that, then, then you have some freedom. So specifically what we're doing is we're, we're growing we have so many battery powered lights that's a huge thing we have these amazing little battery powered pen spots that have really changed our world um 55 of my cost is labor so i've been able to run my business more efficiently um from from a profit standpoint and then and then now carly if she listens to this hi carly but hi, like, carly. carly's amazing <laughs> she just went down the market in Atlanta. So we're looking at all kinds of new stuff like um, these leather chandeliers and uh, we're looking at these, buying these uh, battery powered tube lights. So we're trying to cover our basis of having um, stuff that's really cool and edgy or modern and then stuff that's um, traditional and classic and just growing our inventory so that we, we can get back to being like the leader of new kind of lighting options. Um, so I think like, 80% of a job is like your basics. You've got to light the food. You've got to light the flowers. You've got to, you've got to make sure the room, the vibe is great. And then, then from there, it's the splashes. Like what are the unique things that are going to set it apart? So, you know, focusing on that. And then as a business owner, you're always trying to find that balance of, I can't go buy every chandelier that everybody wants or that's, if it's super fatty or something, I, I got to make sure that I can make my money off it. Um, you know, in a year or something, because no one's going to want it after they see it, you know, three times or whatever it is. So finding that balance is, is always a interesting game because it's one of those, the game of business, I guess, is that thing where all the pieces are in, um, dependent upon all the other things, you know? So um, the, the yeah. other thing I love too, is um, if you would share with our listeners, like the way that you have network networked and partnered with various companies, not necessarily like in a competitive way, but it's like, Hey, you have some things that I, we can really use in our market, but it doesn't necessarily have to be stored in my warehouse all the time and how you've built relationships. Not that the outside consumers know that, but your planners that work with you and where a lot of the revenue probably comes from is knowing that you have those relationships with people. Um, how would you suggest our listeners if, you know, they are a one man show and they don't have a ton of stuff, how would you suggest to them to reach out to other people who do have more stuff and do a collaboration? I mean, I think the best thing to do is go meet people in person because what 80% of communication is nonverbal and just I like I, I do well if I feel like if I get in front of you that um, I could potentially earn your trust and then when I do it's like I'm looking for ways to collaborate with you and, and um, I, I have good relationships with most of the um, most of the other lighting guys in town I'm not as involved and I, I spend all my time like pushing my team a lot more these days so I don't but, but in the early days, I knew every lighting guy in town and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and most of them were friends and would help me out versus like the cutthroat competitive um, kind of thing. Um, and, and then I, I know I mentioned this and I, I try to think back where I'm from, from Kansas, this wouldn't have been a reality. But in Nashville, there's, there's uh, so many of the touring lighting companies. And I've been fortunate to get to know some of those um, owners over the years. And... Um, so I have access, it's insane. You know, I have access to the LED screens. Um, Scott Scoble is a friend of mine that um, owns Moo TV. And he like, so it's like I can go to, to Scott and have access to the greatest video screens, you know, and, and that you can get. And um, 
Premier Global um, Productions is a great company in town that does huge, everyone from Metallica to the Red Hot Chili Peppers to Chris Stapleton or whatever. They do all kinds of touring lighting. And so those people have much bigger inventory collections than I do. And, um, and getting to be friends with them and allies is really cool because I can, I can refer them potentially business that's too big for me. Um, um, Nashville is a very small town, so I end up knowing a lot of people in the music industry and, and that might need their services. And then on the event side, they can help me. And then, of course, the other, if this is more events-focused, just, gosh, florists, man. They, florists and photographers, they all want the lighting to be good. They want the flowers to look good. They want the photos to look good. And so aligning with any kind of strategic vendor or, you know, to each their own, but my my choice for us to be the best lighting company in the world and the world being defined as our world here in Nashville in the, you know, wedding and social event um, and corporate event market. Um, because I have tried doing sound and, you know, some of my competitors, um, I hate to call them that, but some of the other lighting companies I noticed get into doing all kinds of production and draping and all kinds of stuff. And, and quite frankly, I, I think they do a lot of things really poorly and stay in your lane, do what you know. Yeah. So I, I get back to um, that. That's fine. You guys can do that. And what, what that has done is allowed me to be friends with the draping companies and be friends with the sound guys and be friends because they'll refer me. Cause I don't, you know, I'm in my lane as I guess to quote you there. Um, so yeah. yeah, I mean, well, and one thing that comes to mind, too, is just not even locally, but you collaborate with a company across the freaking United yeah. States, and we put a, so a funny story, um, I do a lot of destination weddings, and so these little private islands that I go to, it sounds so glamorous and just so amazing, which yeah. is quiet, but when it comes to the planner and the person that's in charge of not only getting the people there with a really wonderful experience, but getting the stuff there. And so there was a local decor company I was working with and I'm like, we want this big chandelier. And she sent a picture of what she had in stock. And I'm like, well, can you stand next to or under the chandelier? Because I'm really bad with measurements. And so like I'm horrible at math. I need to have a tape measure or I'll just step it off with my feet. But this just goes to show like you got to have like your hand next to it or something. And so she sends a picture and like my head was bigger than the chandelier. Like literally it was this teeny tiny little chandelier. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm talking like a big ass chandelier. And so there was nothing around the island. And so, you know, I call up Blake. I'm like, hey, can we like put a big chandelier on a truck and like get it to Miami and like get it to a barge at a port and like ship it? <laughs> and we did. And you made videos. I know. That was amazing. Yeah. And like directions. And it just goes to show that with like really good communication, you can teach somebody across the flipping ocean and world who barely speaks English how to like safely put these things together and wire them up. And yeah, that was crazy. And then it like took forever to get back. I think it, we, we joke about it. It's like this 72 day chandelier that was on the water that finally made it back. Yeah. But it's like with those kinds of relationships and yeah. we've never done that before. But it, you know, it worked and it got there and it was beautiful and the client was so happy. And then of course people on the island, they're like, well, where did that come from? We're like, oh, <laughs> we don't have time to even tell the story. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's like, our friend Ben. Yeah, like even Ben uh, has this company signature chandeliers out of Florida. And I'd gotten one of his emails forwarded to me by Cater in town. And I straight up called him. I just like, hey man, I'm in Nashville. I'm trying to rebuild my business. I'm, I'm like in a like rebuild phase. Like, would you want to team up? He and it turns out he was coming to Nashville in like a couple of weeks. We ended up um, eating at a taco place in Brentwood and, and um, got to meet him we, and we partnered up. So I have access to like, so like the chandelier that you were mentioning, you know, 
I think he has 40 of them or something like that. So it's like, wow, suddenly I had 46 foot crystal chandeliers at my disposal to sell. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so we still work with Ben. We just did a, our biggest order to date with Ben um, this week, which I'm super excited about. Um, but so, so when I was saying, you know, some of the stuff we buy, we're very strategic. And one thing that happened after the fire is you have the luxury of going, wait, I just lost everything. It's like if you had to clear out your garage or something, it's like, wait, I get to start over. What do I really need? Because I'd accumulated so much stuff. And of course, lighting technology had grown so fast. So there was definitely a, a period of focusing in on, hey, if we had to go Chipotle model is always my thing. Like what beans, rice, guacamole and meat, whatever, what are the five ingredients that we need to light almost any event? And those are the things that we bought light strategically so that we could own the most minimal amount of inventory to make the systemizing for the employees and the training much easier. And then allow that room, we can always cross rent anything we need in this town because of good relationships. Yeah. And I love that. I mean, everybody kind of cross rents to everybody and it is what it, I mean, there's plenty of business to go around. I know it's not like that everywhere, um, but a lot of the production people that I have interviewed on this podcast, they, they all typically have the same outlook in that there's plenty of business to go around. We're not for everybody. It's okay to say no. And um, which brings me kind of to my, one of my last questions is that if you will share with them how you used to, to do, you know, specific venues and there was a buyout and how you sat down with your accountant one year and you're like, oh my gosh, like this really isn't profitable. And so how you decided to go to a set minimum, meaning they have to spend X dollars. So you're not just going to go send a guy on a truck out for string lights and tin up lights anymore. How did you arrive at that decision and how has it made you grow bigger and better? Golly. Uh, I mean... Because you used to say I, yes to everything. We both did. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think early on, you, the, the whole thing is you confuse being busy with being productive. And um, just because you say yes to everything and you're busy and that feels great. Like, man, you know, the reality was is that I got better numbers. I got better accounting. And it was like, wait, we're not, hey, we're not making money. Wait, that job? So wait, did we make money on that? And, and it's like... Once you start getting the data and the facts, and that was like, as the business grew, it was like, all right, it's just me running checks to the bank. There's money in the account. So I'm just, my credit card works or debit card works. So I'm good. Right. <laughs> you know? And, um, just after I got more data, you know, and just realized like, wow, we're not, and, and I see this all the time in our world. Like people, I look at some, there's times that we say no to jobs that is just like, nope. Oh my gosh. And sometimes we'll see the other quote or we'll be told that we're $1,500 off. And it's like, I am sorry, but I've done this a long time and there's no way they're making money. Now, if they want to like, you know, get this job to prove a point or something, then, then, then so be it. They can have it. <laughs> they can have it. They can have it. And you all can, can call us the next time that you, you know, they, I don't know. I, I don't want to have too much ego in it, but it's like, man, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think you, you get what you pay for a little bit. And, um, and, and I guess maybe some people, it, you could argue that they're not intentional about it, but they're not, they're not charging enough for their services. And when you factor in what that warehouse costs and what those trucks cost and that worker comp is $24,000 a year or whatever ridiculous number it is, um, it's like, and until you kind of get that data, I mean, or like a strategic uh, CFO type of person that's affordable. And um, so I, I don't know if that answers the question, but it's okay to say no to some jobs and how you can confidently say no is by knowing your, your cost, your overhead, how much it's going to cost you. Like, for example, you used to rent trucks, but now like you purchase trucks because you figured out that 
it was a much smarter way to use your money, you know, or vice versa. It's just little things like that. It's really important to absolutely the first person. And just as the biz, business owner, you don't figure all this stuff out on your own or like by yourself, right? Right. And unless you run an accounting business, chances are, you know, you're not, you know, that that's not your specialty. Um, I mean, I, I don't typically meet entrepreneurs that are, they tend to be more on the creative side and yeah. a little more, um, uh, less, I don't know. Most entrepreneurs I hang around, I, I never had a business plan. I don't do any of that stuff. I know, and I know what a plan. <laughs> maybe, maybe you teach that if you do, I'm sorry. But, um, but I, it's kind of like, I've never been like, oh, well, let me make sure this all makes sense on paper first, you know? Well, but let me back up and say, not that, I mean, I wrote a business plan because when I first started, the, my SCORE mentor told me to. Um, but at the end of the day, when you look back and you look at a five-year plan, it's like, holy cow, like I've done so much more. And so not that you have to have a business plan, but you definitely set goals, right? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm big. Like I've always had a whiteboard with goals and been let's make lists and check it off and like find things to go, you know, go tackle, you know? So yeah, I'm always like doing that for sure. Um, and I would say these days I definitely have a plan and worked up to where I finally, <clears throat> like we have a budget and we have goals and <clears throat> I mean, we're, we're definitely, um, I'm really proud of where we're at. We're, we're running like a really great business. Um, That's because, awesome. Yeah. Well, if people want to check Nashville Event Lighting out and the beautiful work that you guys do, where can they find you? NashvilleEventLighting.com. Um, and then I know we're on Instagram these days. Um, and Carly runs that. She's awesome. So, um, yeah, they, they could do that. My, I would just say my email is Blake. Um, B-L-A-K-E at NashvilleEventLighting.com. If anyone hears this or has a question for me, I'm, I always like to help people out if I can. So they'd be free to contact me and um, you know check out our stuff if they want or if I can ever help anyone, I'd be glad to do that. And I really appreciate you having me on and all that you're doing with your education stuff. It's been so inspiring to watch just your growth and just as your friend and um, – so I, I'm glad to be on on your podcast, and I appreciate you having me. You're so welcome. It's been fun to grow together, and we have lots of new exciting things coming up. And if you ever need some inspiration on how you can use lighting from a design perspective, uh, hook up with Blake because he's your guy. You really have an eye for design, and you have a passion for it and a joy for it. And it's really a lot of fun to think outside of the box and do some of these really fun, just different, something that you're not going to see every day. Like one last thing, I'll never forget when you're like, oh my God, have you ever thought of putting a gobo on the outside of the tent? Not on the inside, but on the outside. I'm like, what? And you know, now it's like everybody's doing it, but it's like just those different unique things where you know, you put a few creatives together, great minds think alike, then you get the logistics people involved and then you get the crew involved and we pull it all together. And some of the events that we've pulled off have just been absolutely amazing. And um, I know you said in there, you know, when my crew walks in and people move the layout, you're totally throwing shade my way because I'm that girl. What? And what? And Blake's the one who's like, can you put a version number on your timelines? Like you're killing me and a version number on the floor plan. But those are, that's how we've gotten better. Like not to be rude to each other, throw each other under the bus. He's like, you are killing my labor cost, Ange. Like what the hell? And so just from having those open commentary, you know, now the crew, when they get there, they immediately come up to me and they're like, okay, what version are we on? Because y'all, this shit changes a lot. And then it's like, not only what version, but then it's like two hours before go time. They're like, did you move the cake table? <laughs> did you move? You know, we do change our minds on site a lot because we're not a cookie cutter company. We don't do the yeah. same thing every time. We do new, new unique things. Yep. But the bottom line to that is one word. It's communication. 
and having that openness with your vendors and with your friends and not being defensive and being open to how can we be better together and help each other be profitable in the industry because we all work super hard. Um, so I just wanted to <laughs> end on that funny note. I couldn't let that go to make fun of myself. That's too funny. Um, hey, but yeah, guys. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, to anyone, to, I was just thinking too, like thinking about the audience and thinking about the great times we've had together, all that. Just if there's anyone listening that's thinking about doing their own thing, I just, it's been so, such a fun journey. And my, I just want to say go for it. Like if you're out there thinking about something like, I don't know, I, I don't mean insult anyone, but you can get a boring day job any day of the week. Like, I mean, the events industry is fun. And if you, if you got a passion for it and you're interested, like you can figure anything out like along the way. So I don't think you have to know it all to jump, just freaking go for it. And, just and take it, the first step. Absolutely. It's fun. It's all about the first step. Well, thank you so much, Blake, for joining me finally. Yeah. And thank you for everybody for listening to another episode of Weddings Unveiled. And be sure to tune in next week when we interview another special guest. I hope you guys have a great day. Bye. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with your friends. And I'm so very grateful if you will leave a review. Be sure you are a subscriber so you never, ever miss the juicy details of Weddings Unveiled. Also, be sure that you're a part of my email list. And if not, you can sign up at AngelaProfit.com where I share valuable resources and exclusive products with only my subscribers. Before I go, I want to ask you, if you have a story or a product to share with the wedding and event industry, please let me know. To be considered as a guest on Weddings Unveiled, visit AngelaProfit.com and submit a podcast guest form. Until next time, remember to stay productive and profitable. You've been listening to Weddings Unveiled with Angela Profit. Join us next time for more insights to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. For more great resources, head over to AngelaProfit.com.